Hey, and welcome back to The Clinch in this very special series of our features on One Championship. I have sat down with the founder, chairman and CEO of One, Chatri Sityatong. Now, I don't want to give too much away, but it has to be one of my favorite interviews ever, simply because I forgot that I was a journalist asking questions and became fascinated in learning a huge amount in such a short time from a truly inspirational human being. If you've ever wondered what kind of spirit you need to transform your life and those around you, or you're just intrigued by the business of sports casting, trust me, you really don't want to miss this one. Please listen to this man, Chatri Sidhyatong. Chatri Sidhyatong, thank you very much for joining us here on The Clinch. We're halfway through 2017 and you've already announced between 24 to 30 shows for 2018. Is that increase a direct result of the Sequoia Investment Equity deal? And how much do you need to increase your production capacity by to put on those many shows? Um, for sure, the, our expansion uh, plans are a direct result of Sequoia's uh, investment. Um, but not only from their capital perspective, but also their, their uh, expertise and their knowledge and their network um, in terms of accelerating and building uh, legendary businesses. That's what they do. That's if you look at the history of Sequoia. So um, that's exactly why we're, you know, we're, we're expanding our footprint even more aggressively uh, with both number of events, but also new geographies and new cities. Our, our, we've, already, uh, we've been building up our, our capabilities uh, as a company already in anticipation of this. So I would say in the last six months, we were already building up even ahead of the Sequoia uh, deal. Um, so we'd have to add marginal, a few people, basically. I want to talk about new territories in a minute, but specifically, let's talk about India, because Sukhoi is an Indian-based company. Was, was that part of the contract that you considering expanding into India? Um, no, uh, well, Sukhoi is actually uh, based and headquartered in Silicon Valley. You know, it's okay. one of the world's most prominent venture capital firms. Um, some of their prior uh, startup investments were Apple, Google, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, WhatsApp. Uh, all in early stage, and they helped build it into multi-billion dollar uh, businesses, global lead market leaders. Um, so it's, you know, I think uh, probably number one in terms of the history of venture cap in Silicon Valley, I mean, uh, in the last 50 years. Um, that's, that's just a little bit of background of Sequoia. It's, it was just significant, again, it's their first sports investment. It's their first uh, martial arts property in the whole world that received money from Sequoia, actually the first sports property in the whole world to receive money from um, Sequoia Capital. So I think it's significant in and of itself. Um, so it happened so that it was Sequoia India, so their Indian arm, gotcha. that found us serendipitously. Um, you know, it was kind of a crazy story, but they literally um, bumped into our investment bank at the, uh, in an elevator. Um, and my investment bank had just come out of a meeting with me, so he, he had our statistics and just showed it to him, and then eight weeks later, the deal was closed, so. Oh, that's fantastic. So let's, um, let's talk about new markets and territories. Obviously, with the kind of expansion of you, you, you talked about moving into other possible markets, not just in terms of the events, but also in terms of the broadcast rights and content. Mm -hmm. What other areas of Asia are you thinking about expanding to in 2018? Definitely Japan and Korea, um, and then that will complete sort of the, the circuit of, you know, because we've already been to Taiwan, we're in China, we're in uh, Southeast Asia, so we really have the, and then again, um, from there on, we want to increase the density of events per country, um, as well as, you know, enter new cities. So, but with that, we'll pretty much have it. I mean, we have a few, may, maybe uh, um, Vietnam is another country I want to enter, um, still working on it with the government, so. I think one of the great things about one championship that I like as an MMA fan, as a combat sports fan, is your inclusion of local combat styles with the expansion to other countries. What other particular styles are you looking at as, as a fan as a mixed martial artist? When I think the idea of having Hapkido in, in, in Seoul or even Kenpo in, in, in Japan as well as obviously karate and taekwondo, it's something that's fantastic. I can't wait to see that. What are you particularly looking forward to in terms of those local styles with your expansion plans? Yeah, so, so, so one of the things that we started introducing and it started with our Myanmar event last month was that Yes, we put on uh, uh, mixed martial arts uh, cards, but we, we start to introduce the local martial arts um, and showcase full contact based on their rules. So a Silat fight or a Lipway fight or a Muay Thai fight or a Karate fight or a Taekwondo fight uh, when we go in country. Um, and, and that's a showcase again because of our broadcast footprint and our reach, we want to be able to showcase the beauty uh, when we're in Korea of Taekwondo or of karate when we're in Japan to the whole world. So that's, you know, again, if I think about, you know, what makes one championship different, so different from the other organization, the other global MMA organizations that exist in the world, 
um, I would say is that you know, one championship is a celebration of Asia's greatest cultural treasure and the deep-rooted Asian values of humility, compassion, kindness, strength, courage, honor, respect, and discipline. These are the things that we really care about as an organization, and these are the things that we are, you know, our entire efforts are behind. Uh, true martial arts, if you will. Let's talk about Myanmar. You mentioned it briefly. I don't think I've ever witnessed proof that mixed martial arts can make such a difference in national pride that we witnessed last month uh, at Myanmar for Light of a Nation. Are these the nights that you live for? Because it's no longer about the money. You're a very successful businessman. Uh, it's no longer about the deals, the business, the awards. It's about making a real difference in people's lives in ways that politicians and governments couldn't do that. How do you feel about that kind of achievement? Yeah, I tell you, um, I had a company meeting you know, shortly after the Myanmar event, and I said, if there was ever a moment you doubted what our mission was of unleashing superheroes who literally ignite courage, hope, strength, and dreams uh, across the continent. When Aung La won that fight, and despite you know, Myanmar's history of um, um, civil war and, and, and internal conflict, for that moment in time when, when Aung La said, you know, um, I'm not fast, I'm not strong, um, I'm not the best, but with you, Myanmar, I have courage, I have strength, I have respect, I have a world title, thank you, Myanmar. The whole country, watching live, united behind that, and it was amazing. You know, the next day, this, uh, the the Myanmar government <coughs> came out in full support. Um, actually, the commander in chief and the uh, military generals, the top military officer from Navy, Army, and and uh, Air Force came out and you know um, paid respect to 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 Aung La as a national hero, and now he is literally the greatest sports hero in the history of Myanmar. You've worked in hedge funds and as an investment analyst before, but also you're a pro fighter. Um, both spheres of life are about calculated risk, and yet your greatest success is combining those two into the, probably the biggest, it is the biggest sports media asset in Asia. Do you ever think about that parallel between business and mixed martial arts, how it's about competition and it's about uniting those, those two spheres yeah. of life. No, for sure. I mean, like through thousands of hours of training in my martial arts over the last 30 years, you know, I have inherited, um, you know, integrity, uh, discipline, work ethic, courage, a warrior spirit to conquer adversity in life, compassion, uh, humility, honor, respect. And all those values are the values that I use in my everyday life um, as a human being and as an entrepreneur. So, you know, uh, it's, it's come full circle from my childhood days of being a martial artist to now being an adult as an entrepreneur, returning back home uh, to Asia from America. Um, so I feel very, I feel like the luckiest guy in the world to be doing what I do. You know, I'm really just doing what I really love and that's really who I am. I'm a martial artist at heart. And, you know, I get to celebrate with my 4.4 billion peers that live here. So why? Why would an MBA graduate from Harvard Business School become a pro Muay Thai fighter? Um, well, it's because I, it was before I went to Harvard Business School. So, um, you but know, you, were, you stopped your last professional fight was in two thousand and eight. Yeah, and you graduated yeah. way before. Right, right, right. No, so I still dabbled. Again, I would, I would not say I'm a high level, world class, uh, uh, professional level uh, uh, fighter by any means. You know, I have done it for a long time. Yes, I am advanced martial artist. But you know, how do I compare against a Lumpini Stadium World Champion? I mean, I'm just nothing compared to them. It's like the difference between you know, uh, I guess you know, uh, you know, Rafael Nadal or Roger Federer versus a you know, um, you know, a person who just started the the, the, the pro professional tennis tour. You know, it's night and day. Um, but that being said, you know, um, those were very formative influence on me, my martial arts training throughout the years, um, and that's why you know I still compete. And I mean, I, I mean. My last professional fight was 2008, so that, you know I haven't competed since then. But um, I still love everything about martial arts. So, do you think having been a professional fighter does that give you a unique insight into how you treat the fighters and their families and, and all the staff at one? Does that give you a, a different way in which you manage your staff? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, you know. I, again, it's it's um, when I started one championship. You know, I'd already been doing martial arts my entire life. This is something that is deep rooted in who I am. You know, I have, you know, and I still train every day, even now. Um, so, you know, our athletes are number one at one championship. There's no question about it. It's not about the money. It's not about everything. Our athletes are number one. 
um, and it's because you know, you know, I'm one of them. They're one of me. You know, they're they're me and I'm them. Um, I really, you know, in my heart, I I have done whatever they've done. Now, not as again, not as an elite level like they are, as world champions and, and the world's best. But I have done what they've done. I've cut weight. I've I've had to diet. I've had to train hard. Or get, I've been knocked out. I've had, you know, uh, um, injuries, broken bones, whatever you, you name it. You know, um, stitches. So. It, I, I have I have a deep empathy, um, and I think that also is is another big distinguishing factor for one championship relative to other organizations. Is you know we are authentic martial arts. There's no question about it. I think also that what you do so well, particularly with, with MMA, is that for me as a sport, you can have a fighter who's down for three whole rounds, and at right at the end of that third round, you can pull out a fantastic submission. And it's, I think it's a great metaphor for life, particularly in Asia, where people are always trying to improve themselves. You know, China is one of those most great examples. Your life also parallels that those kind of struggles. Can you talk us through some of those early challenges and how you overcame them? Sure. Um, you know, one of the lowest points uh, that still, you know, when I think back, at you I'm always, you know, I get choked up is when the Asian financial crisis hit. My family got wiped out, and wiped out. I mean, wiped out, wiped out, lost. The home, everything, just nothing. I mean, you know. And then my father eventually abandoned the family. And with my mother and my younger brother, and my mom called. I remember one time, just for a couple minutes. This was she was in Thailand, still, and I was in in, in America when I was in school. Mm -hmm. And she was crying and all that stuff. And I remember that conversation. And it really, um, and she hadn't eaten and all that stuff. And it, I never wanted to suffer in poverty again. And. Um, at the same time, I was in school at Harvard because my mom had convinced me to go and rescue the family. And you know, I wasn't the brightest or the best student. And I thought, Mom, you're, you're out of your mind. Go apply to Harvard uh, when we're poor. How am I going to afford it? I have no, I have no money. No, we have no money for school fees. How am I going to eat, Mom? How am I gonna, you know, all that stuff. Um, but my mom, she really believed in me. You know, as only a mother's love or only a mother could. And she puff, pushed me off the proverbial cliff of life because she knew I could fly, even though I was full of doubt, fears, and insecurities. Like I, I reluctantly accepted to go to Harvard because I thought I was going to fail out. I didn't know how I was going to get the school fees to pay for it. I didn't know how I was going to live to pay for it. So I, I only went because my mom begged me to go. Even getting accepted by Harvard was, to me, was a total shock. Um, but I'm forever grateful for that, you know? So, um, yeah, many, you know, many years of very tough, tough times with my mother and my younger brother. And um, I think that's also why I have so much empathy and compassion uh, for fighters, because why are you a professional fighter in Asia? Uh, typically, 99% of the time, literally 99% of the time, is because you're born to you know, at the bottom rung of society with no education opportunities, no way out. You, your parents are likely illiterate or rice farmers, probably in a family of nine or 10. Um, or in Edward Falang's case, five siblings passing away from basic illnesses because they, they couldn't afford, uh, you know, a doctor or medical care. Um, I have so much empathy for that. And, and I want to, through the power of our platform and the beauty of storytelling, I want to showcase these amazing life stories. Um, and I feel, you know, in some weird way, I feel like, you know, it's destiny at play or fate at play because, you know, I've been blessed to, to be poor, poor, poor with nothing. And I've been blessed with, you know, more money than I could possibly have for the, you know, next generation, the following generation. But at the same time, you know, because of that journey, I want to be that bridge and, um, there's a deeper, deeper mission in my, that lives in my heart. Uh, uh, and that's why I say this is not a company to me. This is not business to me. This is my legacy. This is my mission in life. This is sacred to me. Um, you know, martial arts is who I am. Martial arts is what I love. And, and um, I just feel like the luckiest guy here. Is your mother still with us in this world? Yes, she is. Yeah. How does she feel now about the way you flew when she pushed you off that cliff? You know, um, she's a Japanese, traditional Japanese lady, and you know, when I told her I was retiring from Wall Street, 
and because uh, I, you know, I'm a quite successful hedge fund at the time, and I was going to walk away from it all to pursue martial arts. My mom, you know, was really against it. Um, as were all my friends and family, actually. Um, they thought I w I'd lost it. I was crazy. That you know, my mom said, you know, you've forgotten, you've taken for granted your success and your wealth in life, and you forgot your days of poverty, Chachar. You've become arrogant. And I said, no, mom. I really want to go and live my dreams. I want to do something that I'm. That's. You know, that's, you know, I'm a martial artist at heart, that's who I am. And I said, Mama, I have to go do this. And, you know, at first she was very worried as all mothers are, and she, she was not happy about it. She's like, Chachi, you know, you graduated from Harvard Business School, why do you need to do such a, you know, um, a, you know, it's not the typical career choice, how about that, for a Harvard MBA. Most Harvard MBAs, I think, are in four to 500 companies or in Silicon Valley or, you know, on Wall Street. Um, not going out and, and trying to start a martial arts organization or sports media property. Um, but today, you know, my mom will send me e emails periodically. And the only thing she says in these emails, of course she says she's proud of me, but she says every email, Chatri, stay humble, stay kind. Um, these, and this is very important for my mom, uh, and it's something I always remember, you know, and, and, and I think she's very wise in her words that she has always been, you know, with me uh, throughout my life. And uh, now more than ever, it's my place in life to be humble, to be kind, to be compassionate. Because you know, I was, I don't know, chosen one, lucky one to escape poverty, that I can give it back to the world, um, to our fighters, that I can, and through our superheroes, be able to lift the entire population of Asia for a better future, better tomorrow, irrespective of where you are in society, right? That's why I feel it's destiny. I feel like it's fate. I feel it's like my life story is exactly, you know, whether it's martial arts or whether it's going from poor to rich, that whole story is embedded in one championship on so many levels across the entire continent. That's, that's a perfect answer. And in, in addition to what I, you're talking about the hedge, the hedge fund and fighting, it's all about calculated risk. And I think putting, putting those two together has been one of the greatest payoffs in the history of Asian sport. As the father of the one championship family, what keeps you awake at night? You know, um, I'm always, um, so when I look at our plans of getting, going to 52 events over the next you know, uh, few years, and because of the rocket ship we're on, I mean, the, the, the ride's been astronomical. I mean, when you go, and again, as a, just as a metric, you know, going from, on, on a social media platform, going from 300,000 video views uh, just a couple years ago to what we'll, on pace, probably break through a billion this year, that astronomical growth in our TV ratings, everything like that, when I look at all of that, I say, man, if we don't work as hard as we did day one, if we don't continue to hire the very, very best people in the world in every single job function, it's very easy to let success get to our heads and, and derail this thing. So um, for me, it's my biggest challenge every day, every minute of every day is hiring the very, very, very best people retaining the very, very, very best people. You know, we give out one job for every 200 applicants at one championship. Um, it's astronomical. I mean, I always joke to, to, to my team that it's harder to, get in Har uh, it's harder to get into one championship than it is to get into Harvard Business School, literally, you know, because um, of what we're doing. But then I always go back to it, like, why did I start this thing? Why am I doing this? You know, I want to celebrate values. I want to inspire the world. I want to, um, leave my legacy, you know, a positive dent on the universe. So, um, it, it, like I said, this is, like, you know, this is much, if this was just about money, um, I'd have a much easier time. There's many shortcuts to just making money, create hatred, create controversy, or whatever it is, right? Um, but for me, values come above money, you know, any day, and, and it really is about celebration of martial arts. That's perfect. My last question is, what is the future of Chachi Sichitong and what is the future of one championship? You know, I think I'll be doing this in some form or another, be part of one championship um, until the day I die. This is my life's work. This is my life's mission. Um, you know, I will not rest until we have 4.4 billion fans. I will not rest until we are truly part of everyday fabric of society, daily life, of, uh, of you know, 
in the same way NFL is in America, in the same way EPL is in, in Europe. Um, one championship, I will not rest, you know, until people say, the biggest sports leagues in the world, NFL, EPL, and one. That's perfect, so thank you so very much. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.